Uh, so I'm John Hildebrand. I've been a member here since 2016. Been served on the board. Um, haven't been here for a while, so I'm glad, I'm glad to be back. And it is my true pleasure to introduce Jill Sheffield tonight. Um, does anyone here do Facebook? <laughs> uh, it's funny. I never do Facebook. I decided over COVID I was just going to play around with it. I figured I should at least know what it is. And I ended up discovering this group called Connecticut Catch and Release Fly Fishing. I also discovered one about the Salmon River. Completely different groups. Um, if you've ever seen some of the stuff on Facebook when people post stuff, the, the, there's a lot of criticisms and a lot of bashing. Uh, Phil and his son, Tim, run this group and it is the most supportive group I've ever seen. In fact, the only thing I do on Facebook, the only thing I do is pull up to Phil's page and look at Facebook Marketplace for firewood. That's it. That's all I do on Facebook. Um, and I can tell you, what's that? You don't look for well, I do. On a market, I'll, I'll do that too. That's 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 true. I have competition now. Huh? <laughs> um, and I can tell you, I've only known Phil for two years. I've had the pleasure to fish with him a couple of times. Uh, amazing fly fishing. And what you'll see tonight is Phil's enthusiasm is contagious. It's not just fishing. But it's the excitement. Even just a couple of schooly, schooly bass or just being there on the water. Uh, it's just <laughs> fun to fish with you. So I really value our friendship that we've built over the couple uh, past few years. Uh, Phil's an instructor at LLB, a fly fishing instructor, um, and is well known. One of the things I've learned about Phil is whether you're on the beach or we've gone on the boat out of, uh, we've launched out of Barn Island, we've gone to Watch Hill up to Point Judith and back. And one of the things about Phil is that he knows everyone out there. Oh, that's so and so, and they're hey, Phil. Everyone, no matter where we go, everyone knows him, and everyone has a smile on their face when they see him. So I think you'll find um, Phil, uh, some interesting things about Phil's presentation. There's a lot of slides, and take it away. Thank you, John. I'm Phil. <laughs> I've been to a lot of these meetings over 40 years. Never thought I'd be speaking at one. This is my first speaking engagement. So bear with me. Um, uh, I'm from Mestec, as you can see. I'm surrounded by water. I actually live on an island. I'm blessed. And uh, that entire island is, used to be surrounded by striped bass. Unfortunately, 10 years ago, everything started to decline. And I was one of the best barometers in the area because I fished it hard every day. And uh, I saw the decline and I went to all the meetings, you know, Amendment 7. Anybody write in to, on Amendment 7 ASMFC? Okay. So I've been kicking them for years to, to do something to trigger some activity, but they kept kicking the can down the road. And they have been up until now. So thank you guys for writing in. They got 4,200 responses and a lot of them were negative about them so they got it uh, unfortunately uh, con conservation equivalency is still there and hopefully they're going to rework that so that maryland changes their slot limit from 18 inches to something higher or whatever but it's up to them and that was the big mistake of having conservation equivalency giving each state their own choice Personally, I would have liked to have seen them change the slot from 28 to 35 eight years ago to protect the broodstock. I complained. I said, did everything I could. I wrote letters. I know Dr. Justin Davis in Connecticut. He's a commissioner. He's awesome. But the real good guy that we need to praise is Captain John McMurray. He's the president of the Atlantic uh, the Saltwater Guides Association, American Saltwater Guides Association, an awesome gentleman. So with, without further ado, I, I'm going to start with where I started. When I was eight years old, my mother took me to a Narragansett powwow in Rhode Island, and they had a trinket, you know, place where you could buy things that they handmade, and my eyes attached to a bullwhip. <laughs> my mother saw me looking at it, and I held it, and and one of the tribal members came over and showed me how to use it. And he said, would you like to try it? I said, yeah. All of a sudden, I'm going like this. I said, oh, <laughs> I like this. But the problem is when you crack the whip, you have to go like this. And you don't do that with a fly rod. But one thing led to another. That taught me how to move something through the air. And then the following year, she 
she gave me a cane fly rod because she saw, she saw what I was doing with a whip and she wanted me to continue to have some sort of a passion. So, yep, I learned how to use the fly rod, but it was really heavy. You know, it was uh, almost, it might've been a salmon rod. I don't even remember, but it killed my arm. But I learned to cast it, but I didn't have any flies. So I went tight line fishing with worms. <laughs> and, you know, I, well, I didn't even know what a nymph was. So years went, went by, I fished a lot as a kid. I had a stingray, stingray bicycle. I drove that bicycle everywhere. I had a paper roof and there were two trout, trout streams on, along my roof. So I'd pack up the rod, stick it in a case, take it on my paper roof and finish up and go fishing. So the, the love, the passion of fly fishing has been with me for uh, over 50 years. And uh, it just keeps growing and it doesn't stop. And I don't want anyone to stop it. I'm having a blast. There's, there's an endless learning curve. Do you agree? Oh yeah. There's no there's no stop to it. Uh, I don't own any pencil sharpeners. <laughs> I used to, but I, I I gave them all away. That wasn't my thing. I love to cast a fly rod, and sometimes I wonder what I like more, casting or fishing. So you know, I've tried the tight line stuff. Shoulders mm -hmm. not good. I like casting. I always have. So uh, let's just get on with this. Uh, Show that we video. talked about Amendment 7 and all those things. I know this is a conservation organization. I'm a member of the Thames Valley chapter. And uh, so let, let's get on with this. You ready, Mark? Yeah. Is so, this a video uh, or are you? We're going to play this. You know, one, one of the big things with me and, and this Facebook page that I administer is I like seeing people that don't know each other get together and learn from each other. And this, if you ever get a chance, that's an awesome video. And it just builds up to a crescendo. And I was going to start the show. But I'm not going to bore you with music right now. Uh, this is George Grubb. Uh, he owns this lodge in Tulum, Mexico, in the Cyan Biosphere. He's actually there right now. They're having a tournament. And he says there's 100 to 130 pound tarpon cruising right in front of his lodge right now to a river estuary, not far from the lodge. But he said, I'm not after those. I'm after permit. I just he, ate that. He just spit that out. Guys. Remember, ever, remember the name Del, the Merkin? Yeah, he, he probably caught more permit in his lifetime than anyone. And George says he's, he's never going to get close to that. <laughs> so we'll start that video. Pay close attention to the striped bass. This is an integrate pond in Rhode Island. And the worm hatch has not started yet. But you look what's in the bass's mouth and watch what it chucks up. <laughs> what was, look at that. That's a squid. Just ate That's that. a they fresh just spit that fish. out. So these, these fish are starting to show up now. And the worms are spawning. This day today probably got it going really good. It warms up the mud. The females stay in the mud. The males do circles. We'll, we'll see a video of that in a minute. And uh, they do the circles and do their male thing. <laughs> I'm going to be careful with what I say here. So in the process of that, that, that regenerates next year's cinder worm. And you can advance that. So squid is what, what it's all about right now. The squid are coming in from the ocean. They're actually up in Narragansett Bay. I'm going to be talking mostly about Rhode Island and the Connecticut border because most of you guys already know what's going on west to the Housatonic, Penfield Reef, Silver Sand, all of those things. We'll be looking forward to some weak fish soon. It was pretty outstanding last year. Hopefully we get that same return. So these are cinder worms. And they are doing their dance. Can I keep that on, John? Fast. I, I don't know how they do it. They have, have, they have little fins along the sides, so you'll see some white in some of them. That's when the fins are opening and closing. So if you can imitate a worm with marabou, a marabou tail or, or even chenille as a body, that's fine. But I like using white chenille when I take a red marker to it. But you leave a little white along the sides. It seems to work really well. If you want to pass these around, 
This is this is a pretty famous pattern that was invented many years ago. I know the tire needs a follow over, so there's one gear head. How long are they? And we caught a bunch of fish before the worms even hatched because they were hatching in a cove north of where we were fishing and they had already seen them. So now we're throwing worm flies and they're actually eating them all. We did really quite well with them. Henry, take one, please. Go ahead, take one home with you. You can. Oh, you'll be using them. If he's got one now. Any of you guys want one, go right ahead. Brian's got more coming. But this is what it looks like. And you do not want to squeeze it. They explode. <laughs> I'm serious. So that's about this long. They, they can be as little as this or as long as that. And some of them are sort of an ivory color. Some of them are more of a magenta. So it helps to have different colors. But here's the issue. If you want to enjoy fishing for striped bass as though you were casting a dry fly rod, this is where you want to go. These, these swirl on the surface. And when the take comes, you know it. But oftentimes, a, a 30 pound striper will come up and just sip them in and just leave a little ring like that in a hole in the water. <laughs> but this is, this is one of my favorite forms of fishing because it's only 25, 30 minutes from my house in Mystic. Here's some imitation. I like this stuff. This is draw for it. I can just color it whatever way I want instead of having to you know, just keep it as simple. I like to keep all my fly tying as simple as possible. There's some other. This is Paige Rogers, Velvet Worm. Anybody ever heard of Paige Rogers? Okay. He's pretty famous. These are a bunch that I tied, and all of them worked at one point or another. And that's the old worm right there. You notice how this is, uh, Kenny Abrams has the same thinking. And, and uh, if you've read his book called Striper Moon or The Perfect Fish, you'll see that a lot of his flat wings are various colors, razzle dazzle, five different colors. So striped bass see in a different spectrum than we do. And this color tends to attract them. And that thing flows like a cork. So you're using a floating line with a, maybe a 10 foot leader and you hand over hand bringing it in. So it's got that constant move. Instead, they don't go like this. They're constantly moving. So, yeah, the plus, the when pound, you, the, weight, not, the weight of the leader? Pardon me? Is it a weight? It's three, two? Eight. No, it's a totally a floating line. I actually grease the leader to keep everything on the surface. And the, this strip tends to be better because when the fish takes, it's going to get hooked here and not in there. If you strip like this, the minute you stop to go grab the line again, the fish is going to inhale that. It's going to bug's going to get stuck in its gills. And that's when they start to bleed. And we don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm totally catch and release. I've only kept one fish in my lifetime only because someone wanted it and it was bleeding. And it was 53 inches. <laughs> right bass get very big. Right. But this, this is a grassy point for the bigger pond. And uh, you to see it past the great jackalot. Him. 
That's Dave, all right. He was he came prepared. There's a cinder worm right there. And uh, I, I was able to get Mark Sadati to come down and give everybody casting lessons last summer. Oh, I'm sorry, in May. And after the lessons were over, they all went fishing. Anyone? This is uh, the Charlestown Breachway. And if you're into sight fishing, you can you can walk, you can park here, and you can walk all over these flats and have a feel there. What I like to do when I'm there is, is get here on the low tide when the tide starts. I got this thing for a reason, I'm sorry. Yeah, when, when the tide starts to come in, this little channel is going to fill it fill in first. And the stripers are going to come in on the incoming tide, and they're going to use these channels as, as a method to get on the flats. So once, once it, the, the water is about this high, these fish are on the move. And if you have to be patient, you've got to stand there and wait. And one day I was out there, almost not that spot, but this one right here. And I looked over my shoulder, I had a crab pattern on because they like to eat crabs. And I see this 36 inch fish or so coming at me from behind. And it's too close to catch. So I just threw the leader out. Tail came out of the water, he pounced. And he took, he took that fly right out into this channel and ran up in here. And I had to run after and follow it up there. So it's very exciting fishing. Uh, to the to the east of here is Point Judith. To the west is Weekapog and Miss Blomica beaches. Next, and this is the crew that came. That's this is Mark Sadati right here. He's very very well known uh, as a master caster. He's not. He's not. Uh, he knows how to bomb these big chicken flies, and in a second you're going to see what. Watch him. But that's a five weight, and there's a guide missing on us, a TFO professional. Okay, next. That's the fly he's going to cast. And a lot of times that'll limitate a big bunker, Manhattan, or a hickory shad. And that's often the only way you're going to get a really big fish. But this guy knows how to cast consistently 100 feet or more. And he's he's one of my mentors. He taught me. Uh, Watch the cast. Here we go. Wait for it. Slow mo. Okay, so he, he he went beyond that boulder. Normally, this is in slow motion, but somehow it got sped up. I don't know why, but. Uh, yeah. Normally he stops and he takes his time and you just hear that fly go right by in the ear. There it goes. <laughs> Next week. Maybe that's a slow mo one, I don't know. Okay. All right, so move fast forward. We're all done with this cinder worm hatch. Now now it's late summer. Going into <laughs>
French right there in a drop off. That's why it's best to come during the low tide, in my opinion. The, the bait gets trapped against that trench and the, the fish come in. Now, if you walk up to those fish, they scatter. They're all going to take off. You're going to see a video in a little while where I, I, I actually back way up and I apologize if fish gets dragged. With the <laughs> and I had a bad back, so I wasn't able to grab the thing quick. Here's more. <clears throat> That's coming up soon. Yeah. Hi. years old. Oh. Um, you do not want to drag them. <laughs> do not drag them even up on the wet sand because it, it, it removes them. <laughs> Kill them a week from now. More. All right. Okay. There's a couple more. Oops. What size rock is that?
down the other end of the beach. And a lot, of, a lot of times I'll be running all the way down this beach to the end and back and sometimes back again, <laughs> just to follow them. I, I don't have to catch them every time. This guy here. Nice one. <laughs> Just hold them up for me for a sec. Well, that's good. That's good. Get yeah, right there. Perfect. Fishes from a stand up paddle board. This is Sean Callanan. And uh, a lot of people uh, follow him on Facebook. He, he knows how to sneak up on false albacore. He's very good at it. Next one, please. Here he is. friend of mine who came down from down to the tip.
guy is we shouldn't be that close to a shore fisherman. <laughs> it out it's so easy to tie these that, that's how look how small they are this is what they're eating and if i tie them down with size 16 they're only this long <laughs> and they work <clears throat> these are some other guys from from our group this guy's an outstanding wild trout fisherman that's urschel um, where did corkers uh oh some of, some of you guys might know him already but uh Mr. Steph Graff and his brother and a few other people. So we always get like four or five people that come and visit and we fish together to keep each other busy. Nick, please. This is, this is a guy, uh, his name is Akbar and uh, he's an awesome fisherman. He came all the way from here to fish with us one day. There he is. <laughs> Always a smile on his face. The guy on the left of that last frame. I'm sorry? The guy on the left on that last frame. He's a guy up in the rock, isn't he? Urschel? Uh, yeah, he fished. I didn't know that. He came but to he, he, at our club meeting. He posts on all the wild, wild trout forums a lot. That's you. Yeah, that's me. Keep going. <laughs> this is the west wall of Point Judah. Now we're moving into another season. Now the false albacore is showing up. When these guys hit your fly, you're going to expect to lose all your fly line and about 100 yards of backing on the first run. When you get them in and they realize something's going on, you could make another run, 50 yards. So <clears throat> as far as knuckle busters go, you, can't, you don't even bother palming the reel on these. You just let them run and tire themselves out, and then you bring them in. Next, please. You already saw that picture. This is Joe. First, first year fishing with a fly rod. He had a ball. Yeah. Next. I don't like looking at pictures of myself. This is a watch a lighthouse. So most of the beaches we're fishing are way down from here. It's hard to fly fish in these rocks. The Akbar was a nice one. So we, we tend to walk, excuse me, halfway down the beach, and there's a big gigantic log there. Ken's okay. <laughs> it's, it's called the BAL, the big ass log. And it fit it can fit 10 or 15 people on it. And we just go halfway down the beach and we sit, sit our butts down in the log and wait for things to happen. Sometimes nothing happens, but we tell lots of stories. <laughs> 
I have tons of other pictures of other people. You're going to see Mike. There he is. Is that focused? Yeah, that's focused. That's good. That's your president. This is Brian O'Connor, the guy that tied the O worms. Sample. We can go through these pretty quick. The salt ponds are very cool. This, this was this was uh, uh, later in the summer. That's me. There we go. Oh, I was tripping like this. times when, when a bass is down below and the fly is traveling above them, they look up at it and the flat wing gives a wider profile and this tail just flutters like mad. That fly was by far the best one that day. Uh, again, I, I catch five or ten and I'm done and that, this, this was every cast. <laughs> it was ridiculous. If you want to know where, I'll tell you after the meeting. It's over now. Every, all of the fish have come out. A lot of striped bass hold, hold over the Thames River, uh, other places. Even in Rhode Island, there's a place uh, that that has hold over fish. I caught one in February there, and it was 34 inches. I caught that on a September night fly. You can breeze right through these, Mark. This guy, this guy right here, is this tall? He catches more bigger bass than anyone I've ever met in my life. He keeps lodged. He fishes the same spots all the time, religiously. And he comes up with 50-inch bass. I don't know how he does it, but he's got a heavy sink tip line, and it's usually he's out on the reefs. That's when I got him from shore a few minutes. I'd walk out my back door to this. And we would get these religiously back in the 90s, and not anymore. <laughs> I taught him how to tie a flat wing. His buddy had a flat spoke. He took him out on one of the salt ponds and he caught his first big striped bass with a fly he tied himself. He was it couldn't have been happy. This is one he's one of my best friends. That's a salt pond fish from last year during the worm hatch. And the guy that dropped the fish from the boat, he got another one. <laughs> There it is. <clears throat> There's Joe. That's Joe Zabe. This is uh, way up the top of the Providence River. Tons of big bunker. Uh, you can catch these fish with flies, but you got to get under the bunker. And that could sometimes be a problem. False out of court. There's Steve Fiore. He's the matriarch of the West Wall. He's been doing this for years. He'll stand out there all day long until he gets one. Silver sides. Uh, I think that's a bay anchovy, the foot is dull bay anchovy. Yeah. <laughs> John, we, we got into the Yowies that day. That was a wonderful day. I had striped bass. 
Nah, anybody know what that is? Anybody know what that is? Yeah, like a bonito. Bonito, correct. You can eat these. These are ocean, the ocean green bonito. And uh, you can go keep going. We already saw that one. This, this is my version of a bay anchovy. If you look at a bay anchovy closely, you'll, you'll see they have little intestinal lines. <coughs> Whether that makes a difference or not, I don't know, but that thing works and it works great. This is just tin foil under easy body. I put a little flax over the top to match the color of the crap fur that I used. Ah, uh, we lost this guy three years ago. He, he comes and stays at Burlington Game Campground and fishes the squall religiously every day until his time is up. He actually rolled his camper. That's Steve. You saw him hooked up a little earlier. Ha, ah, this is Joe Majeski. He's in our group. They each caught their first alvey on the same day. And I sent them there. <laughs> that was a long drive for them. They live in New Haven. So, they, they, and Steph, Steph came too. I don't, I can't remember who was the, the next morning. He's one of my moderators. And he even got one. And his brother got one, but he doesn't like having pictures taken of him with fish. Hero shots. And even I got one. They're fat. Mm -hmm. This this one won a uh, photography contest at Saltwater Edge in Middletown, Rhode Island, near Newport. And guess what they sent me for a prize? Spinning wheel. <laughs> I sold it. <laughs> he's he's one. He's another really good friend of mine. Awesome fisherman. But I just love the contrast of that in the sky. Uh, <clears throat> the actual image. Shows more of these darker clouds and it just lights right up. There's Taylor Swift's house right there. Lou. That's my son, Tim. He started Connecticut Catch and Release Fly Fishing. And then he decided that I needed something to do. So he let me take over. We actually caught that in a jetty. I hooked it. He jumped down, grabbed the rod, and the thing went right under the bridge and wrapped around the piling. So he stayed with it and he got the fish back. There's that again. These are my favorite uh, outside of the bass. <clears throat> okay, so now we're winding down. <clears throat> the obvious season ends around the end of October, maybe early into November. And then we have these to target. Back in 1990, the state of Connecticut was taking all of the fruit stock salmon to the Odd Fellows home on the Thames River. It's a veteran's home for Christmas dinners. So I marched into our TU meeting one night with a front page article from the day paper saying that that's what they were doing. And they all looked at me and they go, okay, you're in charge. So I spearheaded a, an effort to get them to put these in the Chautucket River in, in Baltic, Connecticut. Three tries, third try, he said, no. And he, I, went, I went to Hartford. I talked to the commissioner and he's, <clears throat> And then I went into the economic benefit of having Atlantic salmon in Connecticut. They do not return to sea and come back. Too many dams. But the hatcheries have to do something with them. Why not stick them in a river? This is Brian Shepherd, by the way. He's a guide on the Delaware River. <clears throat> um, also a member of our group. So the commissioner said, okay, Phil, you're not going to give up. I know you're not. <laughs> You get me 500 signatures and we'll sit down and think about it. I'll get the board together. We got in 2000. Atlantic Salmon Federation helped out. And now, they're, now they go in in uh, October. The bigger ones go in in November after they've been milted. But that, they fight almost as hard as the natural Atlantic salmon. But these are spent. You know, they're, not, they're not as silvery as the others. Some of them are. Uh, they, 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 they stock them there anywhere from this size up. And you do have to use salmon flies most of the time to get them to eat. You might cast a hundred times and get lucky and catch one. Okay. <clears throat> now I got lucky. That's a Mickey Finn. This is the Chautucket River. I think that's it. Thank you. That is it. Is that the last one? That's the last one. That okay. Great. So, Thank you. I got some uh, notes here. Got to 
Kettő. Okay. Look, before I bore you with any of this, how many of you want to try this? Raise your hand. Okay. So we've got three anyway. If any of you want to join my group, you're more than welcome. You have to have a Facebook page, okay? And if you, you have to spell it all the way out, Ken, Ken and Henry are members. Can you see that? No. Mark, you pull up on you must see it until you have kind of like your here. Mark, Mark you have to be on there? I got it right here. Okay. There it is. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really proud of Jessica. She was the one holding the alvey over it. <laughs> She's an excellent fisherwoman. <clears throat> okay, so Beach 101. So some of the questions a lot of people ask me uh, is how do you decide when to go or where to go and what time of the day to go? Uh, first, first thing you got to do is look at the weather. An orderly breeze will lay the chop down. If it's coming out of the north, over your shoulder, out onto the beach, I don't care how hard it's blowing, it's going to lay down. But when the wind's out of the east, it's a problem for some people that are left-handed. Because it's going to, you, you understand the, the power of wind and what it does with a fly line. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you're a right-hander, what happens if you're a Wester, if it's blowing westerly, you've got a sight on your cap. Or I sometimes I just throw my back cast and just shoot it. I'm, I'm shooting my back cast out. Wind, wind out of the east fishing is the least, but I go anyway. The worst time to go is the day after it rains, when the pressure changes and the wind starts howling from the south. And now you've got surf to deal with. I like surf that's no higher then my knees coming in, or I usually stay home. So best thing to do is Google the surf reports. It's easy, just go Rhode Island surf reports. Everything comes up. If it's more than knee, knee high, you might wanna stay home. If you wanna go, you're gonna need at least an intermediate line or a sink tip line of 300 or 350 grain to get the fly down because the wave's gonna blow the, the fly line right back up. I got tons of things here, but I'm not gonna go through every one. Talk about circle hooks. Okay, crush the barbs, if you can. Crush them down, because it's not only is it easier to get that out of your skin, if you hook yourself, it's easier to get out of the fish. And ultimately you wanna save the fish. And get the fish in as quickly as, as possible. You saw it. Have a good night, guys. Thanks for coming. Yeah, good to see you. Remove the hook in, in the water if you can. I, I like to try to, when I'm on a boat, I try to hook them in the water. They make these things called catch and releases. You just slide right down the weeder. Just let it go. Don't even handle it if you can help it. If there's no action there, just look for birds sitting on the beach. If they're sitting down, not much is happening. They're standing up. They probably just landed and they're going to fly again. Wherever those birds go, that's where the striped bass are going to be. Um, these birds are your friend and the best indication of what's going on. They have to eat or they're going to die. No grocery stores. Don't cap at blitzing birds, please. If you hook a bird, not only are you going to injure it, probably going to die. And now the fish are all going to be half mile down the beach by the time you de-hook it. So one of the best advices I can give you, and an old gentleman told me just to wait. It really things to happen. It's like you have to wait for it to happen. If you get there too early, you're gonna be waiting longer, right? Most of the times they have to in the afternoon. And pack as light as you can. One rod, don't bring two. Uh, I just keep one box in my back pocket. I know what's happening. I know what they're going to be eating. And I know what to use. Um, 
There aren't any ways you can get away with a floating line. Again, some of these questions have already been answered in nine ways and often just does it. I usually uh, tie my own leaders 40 pounds down to about 12, all tapered. So parking, what are you gonna do when you get there? <clears throat> you have to learn where to park. And at this beach that I was just showing you, there's space for eight cars right when you get there. There's two satellite lots, you have to get out of there before eight o'clock. Access is a big problem in Rhode Island. Number 12, learn Google Earth. Look from space, you can find parking spots, pull over from space. Number 13, I don't like this number. Did I miss anything? <laughs> I like the lower tides. Another thing about the moon tides, I like the seven days before a new or a full moon and the seven days after. That's when the, the current is at its max speed and it seems to turn fish on. Tom knows. And that and even holds true from shore. It holds true in a lot of fisheries all along. The day after a tropical storm, the surf will come up. Stay home. Don't get involved in heavy surf. You, you could end up killing yourself. There are people that fish from rocks in Newport or on the other side of Newport, uh, the other side of Point Judith above Scarborough. They slide on. They, they end up sliding down rocks into the into the Palmy Way. You know the green slime that gets on big rocks? Mm -hmm. Don't ever fish Hazard Avenue. Stay away, stay away. I, I talked to the fire department and putting cleats in the rocks so they can, can have a tether. Okay. If you want to, want to see the Albies come in, you've got to wait until there's a good, strong tropical breeze coming by offshore. That's what blows them in. And last but not least, please, you seek out all the elders. You got the people that have been doing this for a long time and create a friendship. Thank you, folks. That's that sends it all. So my life. And I, I do trout fish. I enjoy it tremendously, but it's a long drive to the Farmington. And when, when the trout fishing close to home ends for me, uh, I usually go, go to bass, right bass. I hope you guys all had good Henderson Hatch experiences this year. Anybody? Anybody? It's all timing. And you got to go off and, and they start down, lower down in the river below Collinsville and work their way up. I hear they're up by, past the campground now. So you know, that's going to be moving up into uh, above the chair factory and up through the, through the beaver pools, hopefully. Okay, you guys need to get home. I know, I do. I got a two hour drive. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Appreciate y'all coming out. Thanks.